Hey everybody, uh, it's time for another episode of Future View Fireside Chat with, uh, I'm John Bolley, CEO of Future View Systems. We're glad to have you and uh, glad to have the nice fire as we get ready for the fall and the, the colder weather. And I'm here with uh, Rick Clazy. Rick is uh, the Chief Innovation Officer at Future View Systems and also probably one of the world's foremost experts on OLAP or multi-dimensional technology. And Rick, hey, maybe you start, give us a brief uh, introduction. Sure. Uh, thanks, John. So I've been part of the software and technology community for about 25 to 30 years. Uh, a lot of my career was spent uh, early on with a number of small software vendors, largely in the oil and gas uh, sector. Um, it was in around 2006 that I first became exposed to uh, OLAP technology. Uh, we found an amazing use case for it with a, a software package that, uh, that I was working with. So having been part of that technology community for 25 years, uh, I was part of uh, a lot of professional services, implementation and support, and uh, spent largely the last 10 plus years working more on uh, financial planning and analysis using a OLAP based technology. Well, okay, so this, this episode, the, the, the genesis for this episode was that, that word OLAP. And, and I'll tell you where, where I first encountered OLAP um, when I was uh, with, with Bristol Myers Squibb. And I met uh, a, a longtime friend of yours and another member of FutureView, uh, Bill Webster. And at the time, we had 15 different countries in Asia Pacific. And we had to pull all of them together for budgets and forecasts and for the reporting piece of it. And we were trying to do it all in, in Excel. And you could imagine uh, the, the versions and the, it was just a disaster. And that's when I met Bill and this was back in the mid nineties. And he introduced me to one of the early OLAP tools, which was TM1. Uh, I guess they called it Table Manager 1 uh, was what, what that stood for. And since then, I've been through a series of, of OLAP technologies with every CFO role I've taken. And I've always thought it's sort of like my, my greatest hits. And... I'm always shocked now as we as as we encounter clients who are still using Excel. I would say 80% of at least small businesses are still heavily, you know, tied up in Excel spreadsheets. And and the the thing is, when I mention OLAP, they look kind of puzzled, like what is that? And you don't hear the word it much anymore either. And and so I thought maybe it would be worth just having a, a session and and understanding what we mean by OLAP. If it has another name, what is that other name? Um, so let me ask, let me start there. What is OLAP? What what do we mean by it, and how should we refer to it, or what is it referred to as now? I mean, OLAP is a term that's been in place since probably the early '90s. You know, so it's not a new technology by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, it does stand for online analytical processing, uh, and its its uh, genesis is really um, a, a very structured, organized uh, cube data structure. And uh, so that's very different than the other term that you might hear, which is OLTP, uh, which is online transactional processing. Mm -hmm. uh, the two work together, you know, fairly closely, but where your transactional processing is largely, you know, each and every transaction that occurs and the storage of that within typically a relational database, the online analytical processing takes that data, uh, reorganizes it and groups it into a, a very, you know, as I mentioned, rigid uh, structured data cube, and that allows downstream users to have much easier access to be able to do the, the traditional functions that you might be familiar with, like slicing and dicing and filtering, uh, drill down, drill through, and that kind of stuff. So when we're talking about uh, OLAP, we are talking specifically about that, that data storage mechanism. Um, there are other terms that you might hear um, Cubes, for example, you know. So, if we're looking at uh, you know Microsoft, Microsoft uh, SQL analysis services, they use the, the term cubes. Okay. What that cube access is, though, is basically that that OLAP data store that's sitting in between that underlying SQL database and the actual end user uh, access. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, cube and OLAP are kind of the same. If I hear you right, then OLTP is sort of like the transaction processing is sort of the 
if you think about it in the finance world, that's the accounting side, right? That's the recording of transactions and the analytical processing OLAP is for the future piece. I, now I, now I, get, I always wondered why they came up with that, that word OLAP and, and, and what that meant, but that, that makes complete sense. And, and the key is OLAP tends to be some kind of a multidimensional or cube strike oriented database. Got it. That's right. What do, what do you mean by that then? Okay, let's go a little further. What, when you say cube, and multi-dimensional how should i how should i think about that probably the easiest is just think of a rubik's cube you know in three dimensions you've got an x a y and a z axis right and when you actually look at that rubik's cube there's three uh three spots to a side so three times three times three equals 27 unique intersections that exist in that three-dimensional cube okay if you add more elements or more components to any one of the sides, the cube grows exponentially. Now, if you imagine, and this is where a lot of people have challenges with it is, everybody can think in three dimensions, but as soon as you start adding four or five, six dimensions, uh, you kind of lose that, that spatial perception. But in the, in the data store, that's really what you're dealing with now is you're dealing with uh, a number of additional slices and, and an incrementally growing number of locations that you can store data. So in the end of the, in the end, it is really just a, a cube and each one of those cells, you know, again, back to that Rubik's cube, each one of those cells can be referenced directly, you know, by, by a set of coordinates, you know, so in that 27 data points, if you know that you want to go to the, the Z1, uh, X1, Y1, you're going to find one very specific little brick in that, uh, in that Rubik's cube. So the same idea exists when you go with say a 10 dimensional uh, cube that has potentially you know tens of millions, even billions or trillions of data cells. Mm -hmm. As long as you know the, the intersection where that data point exists, you can find it uh, instantaneously from that data cube. So in that case, like the address, if I think about it, that data point has an address and that address is made up of the 27 individual points that all refer to that, that piece of data, that individual piece of data. You know, is that the way to think about it? Uh, in, in essence, it's like, a, it's like a locator for that one single cell. You yeah. know, so in your Rubik's cube, any one of the bricks that's in the cube is considered a cell. And knowing the, the address for that cell, you can find whatever value is stored in there. So if you're actually working in a data cube that has, let's say, 10 dimensions, you would have right. to have that, the, the 10 different identifiers so it might be a year, a month, a product, a customer, um, you know, a specific uh, uh, storefront, let's say if we're just dealing with retail. But as soon as you know the exact, um, the exact set of coordinates uh, or, 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 the, or the details for each one of those, you can drill and go directly to that data point from that cube. Got it. So it's so like a spreadsheet. For example, if I just had a, a standard Excel spreadsheet and I had a number in there, that would basically be defined by three data points, I guess, right? Or two, the row. Really, just two data points, yeah. yeah really, the row. So the cell number A3 is a specific cell. So but now if you imagine now you've got a whole bunch of additional, you know, three-dimensional, uh, the third dimension of that Excel spreadsheet is starting to build up. Now it could be A1 blue. You know, let's just say you got the blue worksheet that's sitting behind the scenes. And then yeah. if you add, say, another tab, you know, another tab to the bottom of Excel and just call it, you know, um, call it, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, drawing a blank on this. Um, but yeah, as soon as you start to add more and more dimensions, the, the complexity of the cube increases exponentially, uh, but it gives you that much more storage location for all of the unique data points. And, and I guess that's what also gives you the ability to to slice and dice much more analytically, hence the, right? Because- Yeah, that's right. So, so like, for example, if I have year, let's, you know, year is a separate dimension, then I could go in and I can just change that year and get a whole different set of numbers for all the other values that are- That's exactly right. All, all other things staying the same, you're still looking at period one, you're still looking at the same customer, the same product, as soon as you switch from 2022 to 2023, you're going to get an entirely different value that's unique to the rest of those locations, the rest of those uh, coordinates. That, that makes a lot of sense. So 
I can see the power of it now because that, the problem in Excel, I guess, is you're, if, if you're trying to do something similar or trying to analyze, you spend a lot of time creating multiple tabs mm -hmm. you know, that, that get you to the, to, to enable you to put different data together and, and you, yeah. can't, you can't easily change that. Probably the, the best way to think about it is, you know, so many, so many finance professionals start with export to Excel. You know, so whatever you're working with, if you're working QuickBooks or uh, NetSuite or, you know, SAP, any of them, you know, it's, it's sort of a common uh, statement that the most, the most popular button or function in any one of those tools is export to Excel okay. because every professional wants to dump it out, put it into Excel and then start to do their own analysis. Well, once it's in Excel and you're trying to get a sense of what's in that data set, probably the next most common function that a lot of folks do is putting into a pivot table. Right. And so what the pivot table does is actually creates a, a quasi uh, cube type of structure over top of that flat data set. So in your export, you typically have uh, all of your columns at the top. They represent the different fields of data that's been exported from, from the source system. So you might have your year, your month, your customer, your product. Uh, and then towards the end of the list, you're going to have a lot of your, your um, uh, measures, like you know the number of units sold. The, the value of the transaction and so on. So you, when you take that and you dump it out into a flat file and you put your pivot table on top of it, that pivot table now operates like a quasi cube because now you have all of your fields available in the selector in the right-hand side. Think of those as all of those different dimensions. You can start to drag and drop each one of those fields, but you know now they're behaving like dimensions. You can organize your table uh, it's doing a lot of those common OLAP type functions, like it's summing up all of your units and summing up all of the dollars. And now it allows you to incrementally drill down and, and uh, analyze that source data much, much more efficiently. That's, that's what the cube technology, what OLAP does intuitively uh, and out of the box. Every data point that's stored in, a, in an OLAP cube is stored and accessible just like your pivot table. Uh, based on a very specific set of coordinates. I got you. Okay. So, so the, the pivot table, on the other hand, the Excel, if, if someone's using pivot tables, which most finance people use, the problem there is you're using the Excel workbook as the database effectively, mm -hmm. right? which, which kind of runs out of, uh, runs out of steam after, uh, after it gets too big, I guess. Yeah. So you've got the, the, the typical Excel limitations of a million rows and, uh, you know, we've seen obviously workbooks with hundreds of uh, megabytes in size and so on, but you do have some very basic uh, Excel limitations. You can break through some of those limitations in Excel by using things like Power Pivot. Uh, you can also use uh, additional connections from Excel to go directly to a SQL database or, you know, some other type of backend uh, source where you, you don't necessarily have those, those limitations. Got it. What, what, what that does require, however, is more familiarity on the part of the business user uh, as to how to use those technologies. Uh, a lot of folks have never even heard of Power Pivot. It's an embedded component directly in Excel that allows you to actually load into a backend uh, table that greater than million rows of, of data. Mm -hmm. But it's another tool that you have to learn how to use, or you have to learn how to use connections to connect to a backend SQL database using a query. So it's, a, it's additional layers of complexity to get to that same data. So the, the tools that we use at FutureView, uh, like Jetox being a, an OLAP based technology with a built-in Excel add-in, it removes all of that complexity for the casual end user. It yeah. gives them like a very intuitive interface where they can operate just like in a pivot table, drag and drop their dimensions, uh, and then use different filters and, and incrementally drill down, analyze and find the information. So it's like you've, you've, you know, they're, the people you're trying to do this in Excel are trying to build a very sophisticated technology in a very clunky, with a very clunky uh, front. Whereas a Jetox, for example, has done it all on its all, all for you. So it's, it's yeah. ready, you're ready to go. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it cuts out a lot of the, uh, the the middleman tools that are required in order to actually figure out how to access that data and gives just gives it to them in a, in natively directly in Excel uh, okay. or through a, through a web browser. Got it. So, so, so first thing I got here is, okay, OLAP is the same as cube technology, which is kind of the same as this multidimensional technology. And, and now I understand why they call it OLAP. It's not really, 
at first I thought what well, everything's analytical processing, but I, now I now I see what you're saying. It's the ability to analyze huge amounts of data in a very sophisticated way because you've defined it by so many of these different dimensions. I think I think that, you know, or or whatever. Every piece of data has a, a wider, you know, a, a large number of dimensions that give you the ability to you have the ability to kind of well. So every, every piece of data has a very unique um, location, a very unique address where it resides and only it can reside there. Um, <clears throat> what that does is it, it, it creates, as I mentioned before, a lot of structure and, and frankly, a lot of rigidity mm -hmm. to the data model. Um, by comparison, if you're dealing with uh, you know, relational databases, they can be almost in, uh, infant, <clears throat> they can be extended uh, infinitely by just tacking on more and more tables and then using joins. So where, where the vision I think for relational is in, in having it clean and organized, the reality is uh, when, you're, when you're working uh, with that back in relational database, it tends to actually kind of grow and grow and grow in terms of the number of tables, the number of joins uh, and the increased number, amount of complexity in order to actually find and, and, and uh, gather the information that you're looking for. Uh, so that, that's the risk with relational, where when we actually start to set up those cubes, because we want to keep it constrained to a certain number of, you know, critical number of dimensions that the business user requires in order to be able to analyze, but also do their planning, it's a much, much smaller and constrained set of, of fields that we're working with. All right, okay. So that, that's where a lot of the time, sorry, go ahead. Slow down for, my, for most of the uh, finance people like me. I, I just want to make sure. I think I, I think you said something I'm really going to hone in on, but take us back just a little bit and make sure that what is a relational database? What's the difference between a relational database and a, I guess what you're saying is a multi-dimensional database? How should I think about the differences and what is a join? <clears throat> so every, if if you think of um, Excel, you know you've got a, a, a simple table, you know a set of columns and a set of rows. Or vice, you know, <laughs> a set of columns, set of rows. Yeah. Uh, you have effect effectively a two-dimensional table, okay? And you take uh, so so when you have a record that's written into relational, you might have a series of fields. Those are the columns in the in the table, and then you actually have the 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 entries that exist in each of the rows. Those are those are the records that are stored. Okay. That's one table in a relational database. So let's just say you've got a transaction list and it's got a customer ID. Customer one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. That's all you see in that table. And so now if you want to get information, well, who's that customer and where are they? You might now have to go to the customer table, which has the right the ID, one, two, three, four, and then it's you know Joe's auto, and they're located in, you know, uh, St. Louis. Okay. So in order to actually put that information together, you have to go to that transactional table, create a join between the customer ID to the customer table. And then that actually combines those two tables to give you now the, a more fuller record of that, of that, of that uh, transaction. I, I see what you're saying. Okay. So, so I may have one table that has nothing but these invoices. I may have another table that has all my vendors. And then for each one of those, I've got to figure I've got to build something that's rigidly connects them so that they always stay linked into one. I see. So, yeah, that's right. so like, would a QuickBooks Online would that be built on relation on a relational database? Typically, yeah. I mean, most uh, most commercial software packages are using relational because it's 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 infinitely extendable. You know, if they want to add more layers of information, they just create a new table, create a join, uh, and then just reference that join in the view that they're using. So. It, they, they don't have the rigidity that that uh, that a cube technology has, and they're also you know they don't have the, the constraints of it with having a certain number of dimensions to like define that, that piece of data. A join feels kind of rigid to me in a way because if I've joined it, I, I'm I'm having this vision of kind of like welding almost, like I'm I've welded these together and now they're forever matched. But then when I want to start to to mix them up, like like I've done this with with QuickBooks and NetSuite where you pull data out from their tables, but then it's not in any kind of way, it's not it's not very easy to access unless, you know, they have a couple of canned reports, but if you want something different than their canned reports, 
it's, mm-hmm. it's a lot of a lot of machinations that you have to go through to get it to get it right in Excel. Absolutely, you know, I <laughs> there's there's usually it's like some kind of an administrator guide with most of those types of tools. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've worked extensively with CRM systems for years, and to actually build the reports for any of these CRMs uh, in the back, you know, usually somewhere close to the index of a of a manual of the, that's this thick is a database schema. And you actually open it up and maybe it's a wall poster that's gonna take about five or seven feet of your wall. And it's actually got all of the tables and all of the joins and the relationships between all of them. Mm -hmm. So the only way you can actually figure out how to create the report in that type of relational system is to have that schema, to be able to trace the connections between all of the different tables uh, in order to pinpoint the, 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 the few pieces of information that you really want. So like if I'm a big company like using an SAP or something like that, I must just have thousands of tables. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. I mean, like every database is going to have its own collection of uh, tables, whether they're fact tables or, or um, uh, dimensional tables and, and other descriptors. Uh, and, and you have to know the secret sauce in order to be able to connect each of the tables to, together in order to give you the specific groupings of data that you want. Which, which kind of explains something to me because that's okay for accounting systems, right? Because once you decide these two things go together, you're, you're actually working to a very defined accounting. You know, I need gap financials and I need it to look like this. But when I start to want to do things where I mix up data a little bit, for example, even basic things like EBITDA and you know, non, non-gap things, that's where my GL systems tend to break down in terms of reporting. And I, what you're saying is, look, if I, if I'm looking at that in a, in a multi-dimensional database, I'm not, I'm not confined to these joined pieces. I can, I can join in my own way. I have flexibility. It seems like I'm adding a lot of flexibility. You're, you're not limited to the joins, but what it does is it, it demands a much simpler data model. Right. than the underlying data store in many of these uh, accounting packages, for example. Uh, so if you imagine that, uh, you know, when, when we actually take that data into an OLAP cube and, and we've got, say, that, that customer information, um, we have to try to distill it down to the bare essentials of what that end user is going to be looking for. Right. So. You could, of course, have you know all of your customer information, and then that could be joined to uh, you know locations, transactions, um, and and what we actually have to wind up doing is is we figure out what's the lowest common denominator that that the business user needs to know uh, for a specific use case. So if we're actually working on say just a uh, a planning cube, right. most most uh, FP&A professionals are not going to try planning for an individual customer, for an individual product, for an individual month. So we might need to come up with a more aggregated view that says, here's a product family for a, a customer demographic. Mm-hmm. And how much do you think you're going to grow or, or decrease uh, for that particular um, uh, slice over the next year? And so we can strip out a lot of that detail because it's not really relevant uh, and not helpful for, for planning purposes. And so that's where the analysis comes in is that um, OLAP technologies are typically used to help facilitate broader trends, uh, year over year analysis um, versus maybe the the lowest line details like the individual transactions, maybe by an individual customer. We can absolutely accommodate individual customers and so on, but typically um, you're not going to be doing a lot of your high level analysis and planning at that level. So we have to interpret what the end user is looking for, um, determine what that lowest common denominator is, feed that detailed data into the cube, perhaps at an aggregated level, and then give them the tools to be able to, uh, to, to, to do their analysis and their planning at a certain level of granularity in the cube. So if I'm, if I'm a financial analysis person, that I definitely want to get into, I want the, uh, the multidimensional technology, a database. I want a, 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 I don't want a relational database. I, I really want a, uh, a, a, an OLAP database, if you will, or a, uh, yeah. Make well, it gives you the most speed and flexibility to be able to slice and dice and do the analysis of the data itself. So let me, let me, let me look at the other, t- now this, that leads me to a question. So, um, 
on the other two letters of that acronym OLAP, I've got online, right? So online implies to me that it happens on a regular, you know, all the time. So it's ongoing. I know a lot of big systems like uh, SAP and they run on a batch, right? They run at certain times uh, because they're not, or, or they, you're just putting data in and, and they might process the reports more periodically. But online in, implies that it's got to be operating pretty quickly, right? It's got to be making, you, you must have some pretty intense calculations. And, and I'm also thinking you've got this cube, right? So if you had a whole bunch of information that was, that was, you know, each piece was identified by nine, 10 or 11 dimensions, it seems like you could all of a sudden have a whole, a whole lot of uh, spaces there. <laughs> So, so you, you, you have a lot of spaces to, to store the data. Uh, a typical data model, at least you know, from our approach, is going to be very, very sparse. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most of our models, I would say, are 1% or less of uh, less failed ratios. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you imagine that uh, you've, you've got this massive container, most of the pieces are empty. You know, it's just there, there's specific slices that will be heavily populated, but the majority of that queue will actually be empty. So... The nice thing is, is that, you know, at least with Jetox, mem memory is only used by the pieces that are filled up. It doesn't care about the, all the rest of the emptiness of the cube itself. So uh, it's very, very efficient that way. When we're talking about online, we are talking about the fact that it's, it's, it's in memory, it's instantly accessible. And that's, uh, that's a little bit different, perhaps, than some of these other relational tables uh, where you know, some of that data might be stored offline. Um, and in order to actually, you know, retrieve a value, it's got to you know, basically work through that series of joins, grab that bit of information that it's looking for, uh, pull it back, join it with everything else, and then present the final results. It's a much, much slower process. And so with, with, a, with an in-memory technology like, like Jetox's OLAP engine, uh, it gives you that, uh, that instant access to those data points because it's always in memory. Uh, the only thing that actually takes a bit of time, perhaps, are some of the calculations. And so in an, in, in a, in an OLAP engine, the other thing we haven't talked about, one of the benefits of it is, it, are these, these on-demand calculations that happen. Right. And so it doesn't necessarily store a value, let's say, that you're, of your average price. In a relational model, you would actually have to calculate and store, say, your average price per unit as an actual record in a cube, yeah, in a, it, in a it table has somewhere. To be in a table per se. It's not. It can't exist as a, a notional thing. It has to be in a table with those. It's got to be stored explicitly. Stored. Yeah. Ah. In, in the OLAP model, uh, we we have the the, the base data is available, and we can do any number of calculations against it. And those calculations are done on the fly. They're stored temporarily in memory, but as soon as uh, something changes they're wiped out and they're only recalculated the next time somebody asks for those same set of values. Uh, I got you. So that's, that's the analytical processing part of it is you've got base data, but then you've got dynamic real-time calculations that happen uh, on demand as soon as a user requests that. That's really interesting. And, and, and I, I'm just thinking through this cube structure. I always, when when you know, when when you use the Jetta, the uh, the Rubik's cube thing, I was I was thinking, you remember the old story about the the king who who had a guy who invented games for him, and he, he called the uh, he called his game inventor to make a game, and and the guy came up with uh, chess, and he's like, the king loves chess. He thought this is the greatest game anybody had ever come up with, and he said, what can I give you? And the guy said. Um, all I want is some straw and the king's like you're crazy I want I'll give you gold I'll give you silver or whatever kings had a lot were very price insensitive at that point <laughs> and uh, he said what I want is I want one piece of straw for the first square and I want two for the next square and I want to keep doubling it with each and every square so four and then 16 you know and what and and uh, or squaring it and uh, the king thought at first, no big deal, and then he started to have his his royal mathematician do the math, and it turned out there wasn't enough straw in the whole kingdom. So mm -hmm. uh, I think he had the the gamesman beheaded because that's the other <laughs> that's what you do when you can't get a good price. But anyway, it kind of feels that way. I, I, that's what I was thinking of when you talked about this this sparse what do you call it sparsity uh, sparsity issue is you could have this unbelievably large cube. And um, 
and with all this data that you know and I need a formula that's going through each and every little space to to see that and I wonder how they solve that like I know um uh Bill told me something called uh what was it called uh skip check skip check feeder you you ever heard that phrase uh with yeah, it's a concept I believe that's employed in in TM1 okay uh, another technology which um where it's, it's not assumed that everything is going to be empty. You actually have to create markers or pointers where you believe there's going to be data that exists and then that allows that data to be referenced in these calculations. So it adds a lot of overhead and uh, maintenance to uh, to some of those types of tools. We, we don't have that issue in Jetox because it's all it's, it's a totally dynamic uh, data-driven calculation engine. So as long as there's something that's a non-zero value, it's basically got its hand up and it says, there's a value here. And the calculations know to use that. If Got there's it. no flag, then it can safely ignore that cell, and it uh, it doesn't have any kind of a performance impact. Got it. Kind of like the uh, what was it? Kind of like the mailman, right? Like when you you go if, if if there's no mail, if he has no mail for you, but you got your flag up, it means you've got something in there that I see what you're saying. Very interesting. very interesting. So you've been working with these OLAP tools for a, a long time. First of all, why? Why doesn't that word get used anymore, OLAP? Now that I understand it, I'm like, it, it seems like everybody gives me a blank stare when I when I mention, you know, getting into an OLAP tool. But uh, what do you, I wonder where that word went. I, I think it's actually picking up a little bit more prevalence now. As I said, it's been around for about 30 years. It's yeah. not a new concept yeah. at all. Um, but it's it's just one of those technical terms that's a little bit vague. Uh, you know, more a more sexier term is you know the the idea of a cube, and so you hear more and more of this concept of cube, um, but the underlying technology behind it is still an, an OLAP type of uh, of engine. All right, another question for you: How does how does this? So, if I'm working with a cube technology, how do how does how does Excel play into this, or does it? You know, because what do you well. Think? I, Excel is still the, the the tool of choice for ninety nine point nine percent of finance and accounting professionals out there. Right. So every every organization has to embrace Jetox somehow. You know, every, every technology company exactly. uh, that's working, especially with finance and accounting data. So that's where a tool like Jetox has a very intuitive, powerful Excel add in that gives it instantaneous, real time access to all that data. Um, there's lots of alternatives, of course, you know, there's, there's, there's Excel 365, like in the cloud, there's, you know, Google sheets. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, there's other web-based alternatives that are Google Excel like, uh, but the reality is every finance professional knows Excel. They work with it probably, you know, 75% of the time every day. And so Excel has a critical function to play in any kind of, uh, fp &A process. So, um, the, the winners of that OLAP war will be the ones that have most closely embraced Excel, continue yeah. to give those professionals what they want and uh, have the tightest, best integration with it. I, I would, as a finance person, I mean, I'm, you, you know, Excel feels so comfortable and I've, I've used a few different systems that try to, you know, try to have their own interface and it, it feels, it feels like trying to work with a command line. You're like, no, this this doesn't work. It, it's it's old, very old school. So I, I agree with you. I think so. I think that that ability to use an Excel interface and have all the capabilities of a Jetox, um, how does that work? Just curious. How how does that work with how does Excel? How do you get to Excel? I'm in Jetox, or I go to Excel, and it's, is it just a an add-in on the bar? Or how do I think about it? Yeah, there's a couple of different approaches uh, when you're working with, with Jetox data inside of Excel. So there's a ribbon that's available, standard toolbar at the top, uh, and that gives you access to a, a couple of different core functions. One is what's called the paste view, which is that pivot table-like interface uh, where as soon as you pick your, your database, you pick your cube, you know, let's say the income statement, uh, then you can just very simply drag and drop your columns, uh, at least your, your dimensions, into the columns and rows set your filters and create like an instant report, uh, a tabular view of, uh, of that data. Um, it takes seconds to learn. It takes seconds to create these views. You can save them. 
Uh, and then because it's in Excel, you can also interact with them using any of the other standard Excel tools. You can throw a chart over top of it. You can throw Excel formulas at it. Uh, and as soon as you change one of the filters and it refreshes the data and pulls that, that new slice of data, like the 22 to 23 uh, set of data, um, it recalculates, shows you the new values. And anything that you've done in Excel is playing off of those provided values. So uh, it, it's really quick and easy. However, there's also a set of additional tools that we use to create uh, very tailor-made uh, customized reports also in Excel. So we take all of the best functions of Excel that are already, you know, that are, that are in the interface, and then we combine that with some of these, these JEDOX lookups and uh, features and functions to create dynamic reports um, that, uh, that, that combine the best of both worlds. Real-time access from the data set into whatever cell you know that you want with a set of filters. Uh, there's some additional features and functions that that are called like subsets um, that create uh, you know much more interactive uh, types of reports, and uh, we use those extensively to create let's say those, those customized reports uh, in Excel. The nice thing too is everything that you do in Excel we can also do directly in a web browser, and so all the same report functions that you use in Excel we can do those in the web. Uh, we can combine it with those customized reports. And so we can actually give you reports that work exactly the same in a browser as well as in an Excel um, um, uh, application on your desktop. Gotcha. Very, very interesting. Um, you know, one of the, uh, um, a couple things kind of kind of interested me. One is that whole relational database versus uh, OLAP, true OLAP database is, is kind of interesting. If I were looking at a, a tool to use, and there are a lot of tools out there in the in the kind of planning and analysis space. I would definitely advise, based on what you've told me, I'd advise CFOs to ask: Are am I looking at a, a relational database, or am I looking at a, a multi a true multi dimensional database? Because that would seem like it has a huge impact on flexibility and, and and report writing. I'm guessing too, because it's probably a lot easier for someone to write a report in a in a multi dimensional database. Mm -hmm. One, one other thing that I, I wanted to ask you, Rick, it seems like if I got this in my head, you, you've got this cube technology that you put on a, that you overlay onto a lar large sources of data, all these tables, and you pull the data out. But somewhere you've got to get that data staged, which means you've got to pull it from a GL system or something like that. How, how, um, how hard is that to do and to, to, to pull data out of, source systems and things like that and it, it, it can be quite challenging it, it really depends on on the nature of that data set uh you know so so many of the standard accounting packages again you kind of have to look at that schema uh you have to understand the schema you, you have to kind of look at it from both perspectives what does the end user want uh what does the source system provide you have to create those customized uh queries in order to pull that data out of that source system and then actually funnel it and organize it in perhaps some kind of a staging uh, database. Uh, so we, we do this extensively at FutureView Systems where uh, sometimes we're actually working on three, four, potentially up to 10 or more different types of data structures upstream. We funnel them down into a single um, data set that's organized. Uh, there's alignment between say the different IDs of, uh, of accounts and uh, departments, companies and so on. So we kind of help streamline and organize it there. There's that staging layer. And then from there, we feed it into uh, JEDOX directly. Uh, we don't necessarily have to use that, that, that middle layer for staging. Um, JEDOX itself, we can go directly to, you know, limitless number of data sets, uh, Oracle, SQL, uh, SAP, Salesforce, and so on. We can actually pull it directly into JEDOX. Okay. Uh, we can do that transformation, that, that reorganization on the fly as we load the JEDOX cubes. But when we start looking at a lot more complex uh, use cases and, and, and business environments, and we are trying to kind of organize and realign disparate mm -hmm. data sets, that can take a significant amount of time to to get those organized before we ever actually get into pulling it into that OLAP uh, analysis and presentation layer. Got it. Got it. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, all right, I think I've uh, I've exhausted my brain power for the day, but this has been uh, truly uh, mind expanding, Rick. And uh, you know, um, 
Next, next time I'm going to have to get you to explain a whole bunch of other terms that we use all the time, like API and everything that sound all that, that I, I think I'm speaking for, on behalf of most finance people. We hear a lot of terms that we don't really understand, but we don't want to really say we don't understand because we think we should know them, but they're all kind of, it's nice to, to hear some real clarification on this. Uh, really fascinating. Uh, um, you know, I, I, I think the one thing I'm taking away from this, if you're a CFO, and you find yourself, I, I, what I talk to a lot is some of the issues with people immersed in Excel. If you're a CFO or, and, and you find yourself with spreadsheets flying all over your organization and, and everybody with their own individual spreadsheet that differs from all the other ones, um, man, you should be looking at these OLAP tools. Uh, Jetix is, is, is definitely in my mind, top of, top of, based on what you've told me, top of class, but, uh, but if you're not looking at OLAP tools, you're you're going to have somewhere along the line, you're going to have problems when you build these big giant spreadsheets and spreadsheet based systems. I, I mean, there's a number of there's a number of issues raised there in what you've just described. I mean, first of all, you've got security of your data. You know, how many of those spreadsheets are being emailed back and forth, reside on thumb drives, laptops and so on. So uh, you could have very proprietary, sensitive information that's out of your control. Second issue is what's your source of truth? You know, so as soon as somebody does an export to Excel and they use that information as the basis for some other report, you've lost control or you've lost that integrity back to the single source of truth. And so using some kind of a centralized data storm mechanism, like an OLAP instance, where it's already been vetted, it's got security, it's live real time, and you know that that's your source of truth, then you've got a much more powerful ability to to analyze and uh, and control your business. So, Rick, I guess one question. So, the Jetox is is all intertwined with the FutureView platform. How do I think about the two? How does the future? How do, how does a, a, a CFO think of the FutureView platform vis-a-vis -vis Jetox? So, so Jetox itself is it's a toolkit, right? And so, so as with any tool. Uh, how you how you use it is only as good as the actual skills of the craftsman, you know. So, FutureView has uh, decades and decades of experience in financial planning and analysis. Uh, a lot of the team are CFO caliber uh, 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 professionals. We've taken their best experiences and we've applied that in the way that we use the Jetox platform. So we've built, you know, quite frankly, a uh, uh, a much more refined, uh, elegant FPNA experience on top of Jetox based on that expertise of the of the FutureView staff. Okay. Um, you can take Jetox, you can actually do a, an implementation of it, but you're going to be constrained by the experience and the abilities of the people that are actually trying to do that implementation. We've blown through that by actually having those very senior uh, professionals. Um, and taking their best experiences and applying that to the way that we've set up an implementation on top of this Jetox tool. Got it. Yeah, the way I kind of think about it, I mean, if, if I'm using a tool like Jetox that's so powerful, it also means that the FutureView platform has that scalability, which is why we have customers who are relatively small and we have customers that are quite large because you don't run out of, you know, you've got an engine that can drive at low speeds and drive at very high speeds. And that's that's kind of what I like about it. You don't... You don't yeah reach your limits. So that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. It's infinitely scalable to any other types of business solutions. Uh, and that's part of the, that's part of the power. Um, that's also part of the challenge, you know, where, where do you start? Right. And so the, the future view platform gives you a, a great starting point that could be uh, implemented in generally weeks uh, and then is infinitely scalable to address other problems that you may be having within your organization. Great. All right. Hey, Rick, uh, this has been really a fascinating discussion. I appreciate the time and uh, look forward to uh, more discussions. Sounds great. Thanks for having me, John. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you joining us. Take care. Bye. If you're looking to rapidly transform your finance function, visit us at futureviewsystems.com.